Medieval poets used to come up with a lot of complimentary names for the patrons who paid their bills, but arguably the strangest to modern ears are terms like so-and-so breaker of rings. These days, you'd think that calling someone a breaker of rings would swiftly lead to the breaking of heads beginning with the poets. But back in the dark ages of Northern Europe, calling someone a breaker of rings was a pretty nice compliment. The reasons for that were simple. They consisted of the Byzantines, the Persians, the Vikings, bullion shortages, the vagaries of international commerce, economic deflation, and the arbitrage business. Because if there's one thing that shows up again and again in Beowulf, the Poetic Edda, and other early medieval literature from Northern Europe, it's how the cessation of domestic primary production of currency metals, coupled with the international manipulation of monetary policy, led to the uneven distribution of gold and silver, made still more uneven by the Spear Danes and Hrothgar the Skilding Breaker of Rings. Okay, so maybe medieval poetry isn't directly about international arbitrage. But what's behind the Norse raids, the Dark Ages, and the Breaker of Rings epithet really was a chronic shortage of enough gold and silver money to go around the economies of Europe. And it really did come back to a lack of mining, gold-silver exchange rates abroad, and a pinch of monetary policy skullduggery. Let's consider what was happening. Remember that back in those days, money literally was metal, specifically gold or silver, with copper serving as a low value denomination for everyday purchases. But in Europe, the primary production of gold and silver, i.e. mining, had hit its peak during the mid-Roman Empire. So had international trade in bullion, which helped to smooth out any intermittent local shortages of gold or silver. However, the gradual withdrawal of the Romans from Europe left the whole region lacking the technical expertise to maintain mines, let alone start them not to mention lacking the capital to build the required infrastructure and the political stability to carry out mining operations at anything like the scale required to keep the economy going. Less silver was being mined in 500 AD than had been in 500 BC, but the population was larger, so there were even fewer coins per head to go around. Hence, after the collapse of Roman control, medieval Europe was staring at a massive shortage of anything to make money out of. Faced with that, your average medieval ruler had an array of policy options, and they ranged from bad to calamitous. Option one, routinely practiced, was to debase the currency and hope nobody noticed. This worked for about two minutes, which is how long it took to test a coin before the forces of economic reality, also known as Gresham's Law, set in. Option two, also popular, was to decree a ban on carrying coins or metal ingots outside the realm. Such currency export bans did provide temporary relief to domestic mints, but at the cost of eliminating most cross-border trade and the livelihoods and purchasing power of anyone who depended on it. Option three was to conquer land that contained gold or silver mines or gold and silver accumulations and lay waste to resistance with fire and the sword. Roman polite society had frowned upon this when practiced by non-Romans, but after the Roman army left Europe, it became standard practice among the region's more entrepreneurial royal spirits. Unfortunately, the resulting instability and destruction forestalled the reinvention and application of crucial technologies like mine dewatering, which precluded anything but the smallest scale mining, and left even this drastic option three completely inadequate to meet the economic demand. As a result, by the later 5th century AD, every mint in Europe had closed for lack of gold or silver to mint. In Britain, not a coin was struck for the next two centuries. There and everywhere else, there was massive deflation. What Roman coins remained were hoarded, and a substantial fraction of European economic activity returned to barter. It wasn't just gold and silver either. The production of copper and iron and anything made with them dwindled as well. Objects with nails, for example, started to disappear from the European toolkit around that time. The quality and quantity of tools and materials, agricultural production, and the quality of life in general took a dive. Roman remnants were cannibalized for their metal content. 
the Dark Ages had well and truly set in. What really made it bad that time was the unavailability of international relief. In previous years, European rulers who could come up with something or anything to export could have brought in gold and silver by trading goods to the Byzantine, aka Eastern Roman Empire, which was fat and happy as the destination for gold mined in Armenia, Turkey, and Eastern Africa, i.e. most of the gold supply in the Old World. The abundance of gold heading toward Byzantine realms, coupled with a reputation for reliable value achieved by putting coin clippers to death via various imaginative means, had made the Byzantine gold currency the standard medium of international exchange as far away as China. Unfortunately, at this particular point in history, the Byzantines weren't in a position to supply bullion even if European trade could have reached them. Since about 300 AD, they had been fighting off progressive territorial encroachment by the Sassanid Persians, who seemed to have particular fun targeting those Byzantine regions that produced gold and silver, such as Armenia. Except for intermittent periods when the Byzantines had the upper hand, the Sassanids generally succeeded. They coupled the actual combat with economic attacks in what can only be described as international arbitrage warfare by maintaining an official monetary policy that purposely overvalued gold relative to silver. In Sassanid realms, values were set so that one piece of gold was worth 10 times its weight in silver, whereas the Byzantines economy was built around a long-standing ratio of about one to six. This meant that the same piece of gold would buy almost twice as much silver in Persian as in Byzantine realms, so anyone who had gold to trade would naturally take it to the Sassanids. As a result, the Sassanid Empire slowly sucked gold from the Byzantine Empire when they weren't acquiring it somewhat more directly by military conquest. The Sassanids maintained a silver-based coinage themselves and used gold mostly for making furniture out of, but that's another story. Mainly, they were just happy to starve their hereditary enemies, the Byzantines, of the entire basis of their economy and their international power. At the same time, they used their advantageous and expanding geographical position to sequester all the silver traded along the Silk Road, plus all the metals that had before then reached the Byzantines via the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf trade routes. That, incidentally, made the Sassanids just about the only empire in history to have single-handedly sequestered almost the entire money supply of three continents. As the Byzantine Empire developed a progressively worsening case of economic organ failure, various emperors found it necessary to keep all the gold and silver they could at home rather than trading it abroad, especially to what they considered the barbarian backwater that was Europe. A little coinage reached Italy and from there some of it got to France, but Britain, Germany, and points north and east were mostly out of luck. The currency metal crunch eased up temporarily starting in the later 7th century AD after the Muslims conquered the Sassanid Empire, sacked their capital of Tezaphon, and melted down what must have been some of history's most blingtastic furniture. The ensuing flood of gold and silver reached as far as Europe and enabled the later Frankish kings down through Charlemagne to mint enough coinage to partially remonetize their economies. Culture flourished once again during the resulting Carolingian Renaissance, but the respite proved brief. The Muslim caliphs picked up anti-Byzantine warfare where the Sassanids had left off, and soon the currency manipulation fight was back and the Byzantine emperors were scrambling to keep enough money circulating within their own borders, never mind trading it abroad. Europe ran short of gold and silver all over again. This gets us back to the poetic habit of calling North European warriors breakers of rings. The term goes back in writing at least as far as 700 AD, was probably part of an already centuries old oral tradition by then, and it relates to the general shortage of gold and silver prevalent in the area during that time. 
In the absence of actual coinage, it was common for a leader to pay his warriors with gold and silver from the loot. There was usually not much gold and silver in the loot, and the deflationary pressures of the time gave it an extremely high value relative to everything else. So a warrior was quite often paid for his exploits in fractions of jewelry rather than whole pieces. The leader would chop a hefty looking necklace or arm ring into pieces and distributed among the worthy as payment. This medium of exchange was common enough to earn its own name, hack silver. And breaker of rings became a term of high praise that denoted a leader successful enough to supply his troops with the most sought after goods of all, metals. Throughout this time, there was just not enough silver to go around Europe. Gold was nearly non-existent. Charlemagne and his immediate successors had initially managed to keep at least some currency circulating in their realms, mainly through mining silver near Mel. But that supply proved totally inadequate once the demand for silver jumped starting in the early 800s, once again throwing supply and demand out of whack. This time, most of the problem was on the demand side. The Vikings, ardent practitioners of bullion acquisition policy option three, spent most of the 800s raiding Britain and mainland Europe. Every few years, they imposed a Danegeld or protection fee that had to be paid in cash on the barrel head, i.e. silver. Each Danegeld amounted to several decades worth of silver mining, and the Danegelds increased in size and frequency over time even as the Mel silver mines neared exhaustion. Payments to the Vikings by the Franks totaled an estimated 40,000 pounds of silver over the 9th century, consuming not only the entirety of domestic silver production, but approximately seven-eighths of the treasure belonging to the Catholic Church on top of that. So if even the Viking leaders were still so short of coinage that they had to break jewelry apart to compensate their followers, you can imagine the dark age that the rest of Europe was living through. This went on for over a century. Relief only arrived in the late 900s AD with a discovery of massive silver deposits in the Harz Mountains of what is now central Germany. With renewed mining at a scale that finally matched demand, Europe in the 11th century went from a currency-starved metal importer to a major silver exporter and international destination for commerce. German silver flowed out as far away as Venice and Spain. For once, there was more than enough money to build infrastructure, stimulate trade, buy luxuries, subsidize art, and the high Middle Ages were underway.